Welcome to Forum 360. This is Leslie Unger, your host today. Thank you for joining us for our global outlook with the local view. It is hard to believe that four years ago, I welcomed our guest to what I then referred to as the wild, wild west. That is what I called the presidential primary season in 2016. I thought that was wild. Back then, we thought that was wild. And we had a guide to help us navigate through that crazy primary season that began with the ride down the elevator and ended with email server. He did such a good job as a guide that we invited him to guide us through the impeachment process and at least the first primaries. Dr. David Cohn from the Bliss Institute will try to explain impeachment and the primaries of 2020. Predictions, you might as well get a Ouija board. Welcome back to Forum 360, Dr. Cohn. I'm looking Thanks to you as me. my guide. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Okay, impeachment. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us first, how does, if it does at all, impeachment differ from a criminal trial? When you hear people, you know, try to compare the two mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, in a criminal trial, this happens, this happens. Yeah. Is impeachment different from a criminal trial? Well, you know, the first part of the impeachment process is a little bit like a criminal trial in that the House uh, is looking at the evidence. <laughs> Uh, and they vote, and then they, uh, you know, then they vote on impeachment. And if it passes the House, that's the equivalent, I think, of a criminal indictment. Um, it comes over to the Senate, where it's true there is a trial. The Constitution talks about a trial being held. Um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will preside, um, but he uh, or she is just presiding. Uh, they're not actually uh, acting as judge in that case. Um, it's, in, you know, the, the senators are essentially both judge and jury uh, in this case. Uh, there are some pretty arcane rules. I think uh, um, the viewers are going to see some, uh, you know, very kind of old-fashioned, out-of-date uh, language uh, when they convene this, this process uh, in January. Okay, so yeah. wait, that begs the question. Yes. Will we see it? it? It hasn't been, in whatever words yours are, it hasn't been given to the Senate. Yes. So maybe we should start there. Is it going to be given to the Senate? It will. Uh, I don't think um, Speaker Pelosi uh, is going to hold on to those articles of impeachment and not send them over. Uh, I think there would be too much political capital that she would burn uh, if she did that uh, because it, it would make her look overly political. Uh, like the House process was simply for show. So the, the articles will eventually make their way to the Senate, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, in, in a week from now, uh, and this is just, you know, after the first of the year, uh, or whether it's three weeks from now, uh, only time will tell, uh, but it eventually will make its way to the Senate. Does she have any leverage? Um, it's hard to say because I don't, I don't think people understand how uncommon it is, first of all, for a president to be impeached uh, and for there to be a trial held uh, on that impeachment. The, president Trump is only the third American president in history uh, to have uh, been impeached. Uh, so we don't have a whole lot of precedent to look at uh, in the past. And um, so I think, does she have leverage? Uh, it's, it's unclear. Uh, remember, the House is controlled by the Democratic Party. Uh, the Senate is controlled by the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell has stated publicly that uh, it doesn't matter what uh, Nancy Pelosi does. And in fact, he stated publicly that he'd prefer that she not even send over the articles because he really does not want to have a trial. He's also stated publicly that uh, during this trial, he will be coordinating with the White House, which is really an unprecedented thing to say because even in years past, um, uh, senators uh, and the Senate leadership has gone out of their way to make clear um, that this process uh, should be above politics and above partisanship. And by McConnell saying that he's going to coordinate with the White House, he's, he's basically said this is going to be completely partisan. 
what does the Constitution say about impeachment? Can you help us? It says very little about impeachment. It says that the House uh, of Representatives, uh, you know, will have the, the, the sole ability to look at impeachment. Uh, if it uh, goes through the process and, and votes out articles of impeachment, uh, the president is impeached. There is no um, appeal that the president can have. President Trump forever through the ages will be known as a president that's been impeached. There's nothing he can do that to expunge his record. Uh, and, and then the, the Constitution says once that happens, uh, articles will be filed with the Senate uh, and that the Senate uh, is to hold a trial. It does not give uh, many details on what that trial is supposed to look like. And so it's really up to the Senate to determine what their rules are on this. Can you help us understand abuse of power and obstruction of Congress? Sure. Uh, let's start with the second one. Obstruction of Congress, uh, which is the second article that, was, um, that President Trump was impeached on, um, is basically an acknowledgment that the president uh, failed to cooperate uh, and provide testimony and provide witnesses and to the House. And why is that an impeachable uh, because uh, the president uh, is not above the law. The president, the presidential branch is a branch that needs to be subject to congressional oversight uh, because Congress does have the power of oversight. The, the courts have recognized this. The Constitution recognizes it. Uh, it's built into our separation of powers and checks and balances. Uh, and by the president uh, uh, not cooperating at all in any aspect, with the House impeachment inquiry, um, the House determined that he was essentially in contempt of the Congress. And that, it's a very serious charge because one of Congress's most important responsibilities besides writing and passing legislation is to have the ability to have oversight over the other branches and over you know state and local government and industry and all that. that Congress's ability to investigate is extremely important. So I grew up hearing three equal branches of government, mm -hmm. which you know, seem like kind of empty words until they get tested. But for people that say, well, but he's the president, mm -hmm. what does three equal branches actually mean? Um, it means that no one branch is uh, more powerful than the other. They all have certain qualities that, that give them power. And they all have an ability to check the power of the other branches. Uh, and that is one of the things that makes us unique in terms of our form of government uh, in that. Um, and it, it is also a change from the system that we broke away from uh, in England. Uh, there wasn't hundreds of oversight years ago. over the king. Right. And there was, yeah, exactly. And, and there were not equal branches. So um, I think it's, it's very important for Congress to uh, assert its powers, uh, especially in times like this. Um, you know, one of the arguments that the president made, one of the legal arguments that the president and his team made uh, was that he had absolute immunity, not just executive privilege, which presidents from George Washington have claimed over certain issues uh, that may have a negative impact on national security if they were to become public. President Trump and his team have asserted that he has absolute immunity, which means that he and the people that work for him are absolutely immune from any kind of judicial proceeding uh, and that nothing that they do uh, in terms of conducting their business um, should be open to congressional scrutiny. It's an absurd argument and, and it's, it's being challenged in the courts and we should know, uh, you know in a matter of months whether or not this absurd argument is actually going to stand. Um, you know, the Supreme Court will rule one way or the other. I think most, most um, uh, legal scholars are betting that uh, they're going to rule against uh, the White House, but we'll see. Would you, with the Senate being Republican, mm -hmm. um, would you have advised at all for a censure rather than impeachment? You know, censure is, uh, it, it's easier politically. Uh, it's just a simple majority vote. Uh, it, the problem is it has no, there are no teeth in it. Uh, it has no... Um, ramifications other than publicly slapping the president on the wrist. Um, I, I think um, 
personally, I think uh, the House did exactly the right thing. I, I think that, uh, in fact, I don't believe the House went far enough. They only filed two articles of impeachment on abuse of power and a contempt of, of Congress. Uh, I, I think uh, the Trump record shows so many more abuses uh, and violations of the law, you know, from emoluments to uh, paying off of adult film stars, which violated campaign finance laws. There, there are, you know, self-dealing with his properties. There, there are, there's a, uh, a slew of things that the, um, the House could have impeached him on, and they chose to take a very narrow uh, strategy and focus simply on what happened uh, in the Ukraine scandal. Um, that uh, I, I, I think it was a mistake, tactically, because uh, I think they should have gotten all this stuff on the record and voted on it. Um, that said, I think absolutely the House uh, should have gone with impeachment, because impeachment's a very serious thing. Again, he will be known forever um, as only the third president in American history to be impeached. That's a serious thing. He will wear the, sky, the scarlet oh. eye of history. Uh, People might understand that they might understand abuse yeah. of power, they might understand obstruction of Congress, but quid pro quo, quid pro quo. Yes. Can you help us understand that? Why is that that a problem in um, the Constitution? Well, you know, and, and quid pro quo is a very problematic term because it's Latin. Uh, I, I don't speak Latin. I'm sure you don't speak Latin. You know, most people don't understand Latin. But it essentially means uh, uh, doing something in return for something. And now, let me just say, quid pro quos uh, on the world stage, they happen all the time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, foreign policy. Uh, you know, uh, one country does something uh, for one, in exchange, uh, you know, uh, this country will, will, will do something for them. The difference is, in this particular uh, case, the quid pro quo that President Trump was trying to get the Ukrainians uh, or the quid pro quo that was placed on the Ukrainians was for the Ukrainians to investigate a political opponent in exchange uh, for then the United States um, giving military aid to Ukraine to help them in their war with Russia. Um, the problem is the quid pro quo surrounded a um, situation that would have helped the president personally not helped the country, not helped the United States, not helped our national security interests, but would have helped him personally uh, in his 2020 campaign against what you know uh, may be one of his political opponents. And so a quid pro quo in order to uh, help uh, the president personally, that's very problematic uh, and absolutely impeachable. Uh, it's unethical. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, not only is it impeachable, but it's something for sure that a president should be removed from office for. Now, as you said, that, that uh, Speaker Pelosi will hand over the, the articles of impeachment to the Senate, and we mm -hmm. will see a Senate impeachment hearing. Can you give us two or three things that people should look for they tune in and watch sure. an impeachment hearing. Yeah, the, the one thing to look for is, will the Democrats be successful in getting three or four Republicans to come to their side uh, in order to get 51 votes, uh, for example, to bring in witnesses? Um, just this morning, uh, former National Security Advisor John Bolton said that if he were subpoenaed, he would uh, be willing to testify at a Senate trial. That's huge news because John Bolton was at the center of so many of these, th these things having to do uh, with the Ukraine policy. Um, so can they get, um, can the Democrats get somebody like a Republican senator like uh, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska? Can they get somebody like Susan Collins mm -hmm. from Maine? Can they get Mitt Romney mm -hmm. from Utah? If, can they get a handful of these Republicans to come over and vote with them so that they can force an actual trial with actual witnesses? Just like happened uh, in the, the President Clinton case uh, where they had witnesses uh, that testified. So um, I think that's one thing very much to, to, to look for. Another thing is, will uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, uh, move to end the Senate trial very quickly, uh, which he potentially can do? Will he have a, a vote right up front to dismiss it, saying that there's not enough evidence? You know, uh, it's possible. And what, would it, what would it require? How many votes would it um, require for that? That would require, um, I, I believe that would require 
Oh boy, you've put me on the spot here. Um, I believe that will require a majority vote. Uh, I would have to look at the Senate rules that are in place from 1999, um, but I believe that would require a majority vote. I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. So we, we need to look at, is he gonna move to very quickly uh, during the trial? Uh, because I think if he had it his way, he'd be able to do that if he could know that he wasn't gonna get a lot of political blowback. So those are two things uh, really to look for in this process. You know, one crazy idea is when um, the uh, house managers, uh, you know, are, are named and, you know, they put their charges out uh, and then the Senate asks, um, you know, President Trump to come and testify or somebody in his place, will the president actually come? Now, you know, the president likes a good reality show. So I'm not 100% sure that he would say no. Okay. We have been talking about yeah. uh, the impeachment proceedings that are, are in our future. Also in our future are the primaries. Um, Dr. David Cohn, the Bliss Institute, is going to take us on a 30,000-foot journey through the uh, upcoming primaries. First, I have to ask you, why why did so many candidates think it was their time to run? Well, I think, um, and, and it is very uncommon uh, when you have an incumbent president uh, that so many people in the opposition party uh, want to run. And that's uh, one of the reasons why so many Democrats jumped into the race uh, is because, number one, Donald Trump is very vulnerable. Um, in his approval rating, he has never reached 50% in approval. Um, he's the only president, since polling was invented, uh, to not have reached 50% in their first three years in approval. Um, and in order to secure re-election, you really have to be at 50% or above. Um, in fact, no president has one re-election without being at 50% or above. So uh, vulnerability of the president. I think also the 2016 election showed a lot of uh, people in the political system that, heck, if, if Donald Trump can win the presidency, anybody can win, literally. And that's why you have uh, a businessman like Tom Steyer and Andrew Wang uh, jumping in, uh, Andrew Yang, Yang jumping into the, into the race. Um, because you know they, they don't have any political experience, but they're like, hey, you know, if, if Donald Trump can win, uh, you know, I'm wealthier than he is, uh, I, you know, why not? Um, so I, I think that, and and you have a lot of people, you know, from the House of Representatives that, that jumped in. Yeah, like uh, there's so many statistics to show yeah. that congressmen, Congress people, yes. make it to president, yeah. right? You know, the irony is you've had so many members of Congress running this year, and and some wealthy business people. Um, but you've had very few governors, and usually governor is the, the stepping stone to, I to know the that, White but the, House. But the governors that were there could, got, got nothing. Even the senators basically haven't got, you yeah. know, a Cory Booker, it seems like in another year, yeah. would have. The Cory Booker's been the, the, the biggest surprise for me, that he just has not caught, mm -hmm. uh, gotten the traction that I think, I mean, I think he's a very solid candidate. Uh, extremely articulate, knowledgeable, experienced, you know, former mayor. Mayor. And, and he, you know, he checks all the boxes. Yes. And yet, but the problem is there are so many other people that have gotten so much more uh, press. Um, and uh, it's just, and, and the field's so big, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, if you're not in that first tier, it's, it's hard. So how, in, in a few sentences, how do you explain Mayor Pete? Um, uh, mayor Pete is a... Uh, First of all, extremely articulate guy. He knows his stuff. Um, he is but to a, make it to the right. to really the top tier. Great debater. I, I think what it was is he he got this momentum uh, early on. I think he had a CNN appearance, a town hall, and he caught fire. Um, and he is he has really kept up with the, that momentum. He's done a very good job fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, I think his campaign has done a great job. Uh, at just positioning him as really the, the Biden alternative. You know, Mayor Pete started out way on the left part of the political spectrum when this first started, and then he realized his lane was more near uh, where Joe Biden is. Uh, and as Joe Biden has shown that he's, he's weaker than some people predicted, uh, I think uh, Buttigieg has, has really taken advantage of that. 
Iowa and New Hampshire are our first two primary states. They're not demographically representative no, of the rest of the country. They aren't. So how is that going to affect the early voting? I mean, let's just say right now, Iowa and New Hampshire have no business being the first two primary states. It drives me crazy but every election are. cycle. And they are, and they're going to be there for the foreseeable future. But mm -hmm. really, if we want to fix our political system, you know, a state like Ohio or a state like Michigan or a state like Florida mm -hmm. should be, you know, the first or second state. It's crazy that you have Iowa and New Hampshire up there. Um, Iowa is extremely important, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's particularly vexing because it's a caucus. And so explain to us the difference between a caucus and a yeah. popular vote. Well, a caucus and a primary, essentially, the, the difference is a primary is, is what happens here in Ohio, it's where you go into a voting booth and, and you vote, have a secret ballot right? and you vote and, and that's it. It takes, you know, five minutes, especially in a primary, to, to complete that process. In a caucus, especially the way the Iowa caucus works, you actually have to show up in person, you have to spend hours, you, you know, the, and the caucus could take place maybe in a school gymnasium, maybe in a church, okay. maybe in somebody's <laughs> dining room with 25 other people or 15 other people, depending upon where you live. And you have to literally spend hours talking and haggling and, and, and the vote is in public. It's not, it's not a secret ballot. Uh, and you know, it could be a show of hands. It could be you go over into this corner. If you support this candidate, you go over into this corner. It's, it's a crazy process. It's kind of cool. Um, you know, and, and on a local level, it's kind of the way politics should be. It's very transparent. Um, but this is, this is picking a president. And so the problem with the Iowa caucus and uh, a lot of these primary elections is that only the, the most uh, ideologically driven people are the ones that are going to take part in these things, which means the more the people that maybe don't spend as much time thinking about politics, maybe the people that are more in the, politi in the like middle of the political normal spectrum. People. Normal people, <laughs> right? Uh, people that have childcare issues, for example, that are working and they can't spend hours doing this. Um, you know, they're not going to be taking part. And so you're in, in what Iowa, uh, a place like Iowa does, and what the primaries do in general is it rewards uh, the most ideologically um, driven candidates or the ones that are sitting out on the on the extremes of the political spectrum and 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 then you end up with ideological candidates and then when you get to the general election you know you may have people that aren't closer to where the general electorate is so in what may be my last question mm -hmm. the bloomberg strategy wait sit out the first four yeah the no clear winner and then everything kind of like starts all over again yeah i've heard a couple people say I'm considering Bloomberg. Yeah. I'm open to Bloomberg. So where does that leave Bloomberg a month or two from now? Well, you know, the Bloomberg strategy only works if you're somebody like uh, Michael Bloomberg and you've got, you know, billions of dollars. But that's right. It, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and in the last month, I've not seen uh, any candidate come close to the number of uh, ads, television ads that Bloomberg has run. Uh, for a typical person getting in that late to the race, they would have absolutely no shot. Um, like Deval Patrick. <laughs> right, like Deval Patrick, right, exactly. <laughs> they want to know what was he thinking. Yes. Or the governor of Montana who got in maybe a month after everybody else. Mm -hmm. He just never was able to get any kind of, of traction mm -hmm. uh, because it's starting earlier and earlier. But, you know, with Michael Bloomberg, when you've got that kind of money to spend on media, it almost doesn't matter. Um, so wh what's that going to mean for... April, May, June, what is that going to be? Heck mean? if I know. <laughs> and I have absolutely no idea. Uh, you know, we'll just have to, we, I, I think your viewers should watch Iowa. Iowa's the most important because if you don't have a top four or five finish in Iowa, uh, and if you have finished a lot lower than expectations, you're done. You know, your money dries up, your media attention dries up. If I gave you a million dollars. Yes. What would you tell me the ticket was going to be in fall of 2020? A million dollars? A million dollars. Oh my gosh. I, I would, you leave it on the, would you leave a million dollars on the table? Um, God, you know, I, uh, it's almost impossible to predict. You I, need that Ouija board. I think the thing is, uh, in 2004, uh, John Kerry, nobody was picking him to even finish in the top five. He ended up winning the Iowa caucus. And then he, he ran the table pretty much. Um, so 
I, I would say, I would caution people, you know, you're, you're going to see on television the top three, top four mentioned all the time, you know, Biden, Sanders, Warren, Buttigieg. Do not discount somebody like Amy Klobuchar. Do not discount somebody like Cory Booker, because if they can have a breakthrough performance and end up in the top three, um, and, you know, they, they can, the, the whole race can, can turn on its head. Amy Klobuchar is my dark horse because mm -hmm. um, I think she plays really well in a state like Iowa. Uh, you know, she's from Minnesota, it's a neighboring state. Um, her numbers, if you look at them, they, they keep tracking upward. And uh, I think she's going to be the one that is viewed as kind of the Biden and Buttigieg alternative. Uh, in For president. Absolutely. Okay. Yes or no, this is not a yes or no question, but a yes or no answer. Will the Electoral College trump the popular vote in 2020? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Okay. Our Democratic, I, I hope not. <laughs> our Democratic process has many moving parts and mm. many voting contingencies. Our guest today is an expert in presidential elections and all of those moving parts. We've heard terms throughout this process, and our guest has helped us understand them. Abuse of power, articles of impeachment. Um, we always say it's important to vote. This year, it's important to stay engaged. Thank you for watching Forum 360 with Dr. David Cohn. I'm your host today. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.